Hi everybody, welcome to lab number five. In this lab we'll be travelling to the Penrith sheet and practice our skills of drawing cross sections for dipping rocks. So this is the Penrith sheet um, turned on its side and hopefully what you are struck by um, as is different to the Sidmouth sheet that we looked at last time is that the exposures on the Penrith sheet they tend to form these strip like exposures which aren't parallel to the ground contours at least in this part of the map where we go from our Carboniferous limestone rocks um, into our Carboniferous coal measures and then between those there's an unconformity on top of which we have Permian and Triassic rocks. You can see if we were to walk along the landscape in this orientation all of the exposures that we cross would have this northwest southeast trending strip like exposure pattern. Okay, That changes when we get to the far east of the map where this sequence of rocks that have uh, gone from the Carboniferous up to the Triassic there's a massive great fault that runs along the map in that orientation and then to the east of that fault we're back into our Carboniferous limestones but they look more horizontally bedded they're forming these bullseye type exposure patterns um, which are parallel to the the ground contours similar to what we saw in Sidmouth but the bit of the map that we're going to focus on is everything to the west of this big fault so we're going to largely ignore um, this material for the purposes of drawing our cross section so that's the general um, structure of the map we have these beds which are dipping at relatively low angles towards the east and that dip is causing the rock units to have these strip like exposures which run the length of our map so that's osteotrigraphy it's not particularly complex there is there is uh, some something of an unconformity here between the carboniferous and the, the permian rocks um, all of the rocks have been faulted there seems to be this older set that's trending towards the northeast which have been cut by this younger set which are trending towards the northwest you can see that when we follow these northeast trending faults they stop at those faults at the northwest faults which indicates that they're older and have been cross cut by this younger this younger sequence but aside from that faulting we have these gently dipping beds that are dipping towards the the east northeast and what we're going to try and do um, is answer some questions about the rocks that we see and then draw a cross section through this area so lab 5 there's a series of questions that ask you to interpret the outcrop patterns of rocks to measure the thicknesses and widths of, of different features on the map to calculate some um, exaggerated dips using simple trigonometry and then to draw a cross section on the panel following so in the next part of the video I'll take you through a demonstration of how we would tackle a map like this and draw our cross section and along the way that should give you the information you need to complete the lab so I'll see you in the next bit of the of the video Okay guys, welcome to the Penrith sheet. In this part of the video I'm going to show you my method for drawing a cross section for these uniformly dipping rocks and to see what they look like in the subsurface. This is your Penrith map and you can see that most of the outcrops in this western half of the map they form these strip like exposures that run down the length of the map. Okay, that sort of exposure pattern 
in the case that these rocks have a uniform dip, we don't see any repetition, so we don't think that they're folded. In this part of the map, we don't see any sort of bullseye-like exposure patterns that are parallel to the ground contour, so we don't think that they're um, horizontal. And the outcrop patterns themselves, they're not perfectly linear uh, and straight across the, the, the region. They kind of bend and deflect around the topography, indicating that they're not perfectly vertical. They've got some, some angle of dip. So that's the sort of story in, in this region of the map. Where we go from the Carboniferous Limestones to the Carboniferous Millstone Grit and the Coal Measures before there's an unconformity between these Carboniferous Rocks and our Permian Sandstones. So that's the general stratigraphy. But then as we get to this point you can see that our Permian Sandstones and Triassic Sandstones they've been truncated by this rather significant set of faults. Down here you can see the name the Lengthweight Fault and here's the Elskill Fault and you can see that that's truncated these, these Permian Sandstones and uh, to the eastern half of the fault has emplaced next to them some of these Carboniferous Limestones, these blues and oranges. Now you can estimate the amount of um, displacement along that fault by looking at the stratigraphic thickness that's been lost between our, our Permian sandstones and our Carboniferous limestones. When I say lost, I mean the juxtaposition has brought these very much older Carboniferous rocks up to in contact with our, with our much younger Permian rocks. Okay, so looking at your, um, your stratigraphic column, between those two points you've lost the entirety of the millstone grit series as well as the, the coal measures. Now when you look at the rocks on the eastern side of the fault you can see that their outcrop changes completely relative to those on, on the western side of the fault. On the eastern side of the fault you can see that these outcrop patterns are forming these concentric rings which are parallel to the ground contours in, in most places. And that indicates that the rocks on this side of the fault, on the, on, the west, on the eastern side of the fault rather, are still pretty much horizontal. They're not dipping like um, the rocks on the, on the western side, the rocks on the eastern side, they look like they're, they're relatively flat. Now this fault isn't the focus of our cross-section today. Indeed, we, we, our cross-section doesn't quite extend that far. But I just want you to see this difference in outcrop stars between rocks which are which have a dip, a uniform dip, and rocks which are still largely horizontal. So just take a moment to, to look at that um, difference in outcrop pattern. Now what we're going to do is start drawing a cross section and what I've done is used uh, two bits of tape to show the two corners, the two extremes of our cross section. So what we're going to do is draw a cross section along that line to show what the subsurface geology in the area would be doing. So what I'm going to do now is zoom in on that area and then we can, we can get drawing. I've got my tools ready, I've got my propelling pencil, I've got my compass, uh, my protractor rather, I've got my ruler, I've got a delightful range of um, colouring pencils, I've got a calculator and I've got a pen to write myself um, some little notes as we go along. So if you want to get together your tools and then we can start drawing our cross section and then that will help us finish up with our lab. Okay, see you in a second. Okay then guys, so now this part of the video refers to question number five which asks you to construct a sketch cross-section and that's one without topography between the points 470, 400 and 540, 450. 
So what I've already done is um, gone to the 470 grid line and the 400 grid line and that's this piece of tape there. So that's my first point on the cross section. And then the second point on the cross section, 540, 450. So what we're trying to do is see the subsurface geology along a line that connects these two points. Okay. Now with any map that you have, <laughs> never ever mark it. I'm just doing it so I don't have to keep um, knocking the camera as I clumsily move my piece of paper around. Okay, so this question asks you because the um, dip of the rocks around here isn't particularly large, they're, they're only dipping at about 10 degrees or so. This question has asked you to construct a cross section which has four times vertical exaggeration. So we're going to stretch our, our rocks and, and change our angles of dip. In order to do this, we'll need to draw the dip of the beds to take into account this exaggeration using the formula that's um, given to you at the bottom of your screen and um, on the PDF of the lab book. But let's get to that in a minute and first let's start drawing our cross section. So I've got my, my strip of paper and I've lined up my strip of paper so that it goes through the corners. This is, this is B and this intersection here is A. And I don't have to draw a hill profile because we're doing a, a sketch cross section. So instead, what I'm going to do is move on, is straight away move on to plotting my geological contacts. <coughs> so from A all the way to this point, we're in the Carboniferous Millstone Grit. So I'll just give that an MG. And then we've got a thin sliver here of the coal measures and then all the way from there, 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 there until there we're in this Penrith sandstone and then from we've got a fairly interesting interbedded sequence here in the Permian Eden shales and I'm just going to mark these thin beds, the, um, <clears throat> these dolomite beds that are in the, the Permian shells and mark on in between them as um, and then once we're outside of the Permian shells we've got this thin we've got this thin dolomite dike which either side of it we're into our Triassic St. B sandstones. Now also what we've neglected to, to put on this cross section line are we have these faults which I'm marking in the different then so I can tell them apart from um, stratigraphic contacts I've got one there and I've got this other one, the scratch mill scar fault there. And right now I can't see any other contact um, that I should plot onto my um, cross section line. I think that's all of them. So let's um, move it away. And if you're, if you're like me, you tend to learn things better um, if they've got some sort of colour to them. So what I'm going to do is just mark on my my cross section line. I'm going to mark on the colour of those rocks. Slightly difficult when you've just got some shades of grey but I've got my millstone grits which are a slightly lighter grey than my coal measures. And then I've got an enormous expanse of my Penrith sandstone in, in orange. Yeah, all the way up to all the way up to there. Then I go alternating yellows in my Eden shales with these purple 
dolomites inspected <clears throat> and then I'm into my St. B's sandstones sort of almost almost the right colour and then let's use a hearty red for my dolerite dike ok so let's move that um, section off off the line and then let's have a little look around to see if I can get some quantitative data about the dip of the bed and I don't want to stray too far away from my section there's, there's no point looking way over there or way over there for the dips of the beds because some of these rocks they might kind of flex their dip might change I want to draw uh, the dip of the rocks as close to my thin section line as I possibly can so I'm just having a little look around and just I think off to the side of the camera here I can see dips of about ranging somewhere between 12 15, 5 degrees over in the St. B's sandstone just to the west and then if we went this way just on this side of the um, cross section we can see that there's a couple of 10 degree dips in the carboniferous rocks so what I'm going to do with with my faith as a geologist I'm going to assume that if our rocks are dipping somewhere around between 5 and 15 degrees on the east side and about 10 degrees on the west side I'm going to assume because I don't have any more specific information that all of these rocks are dipping at about 10 degrees over onto the east okay so those are my sedimentary rocks that's the dip of my my sediments Okay. Now looking at the faults then, they don't typically have any um, dip associated with them. Instead you'll have to infer what the dip is based on the, um, the, the, the outcrop pattern of the fault itself. And our cross section has crossed these two faults, the scratch mill scar fault and the Abbott Must Fault going, going this way. They're the only two that cross our cross-section line. Now I'm looking at the Scratch Mill Scar Fault and I think for the region that our um, cross-section goes through this Scratch Mill Scar Fault is very very linear it's almost perfectly straight. So I'm going to assume without having any better information that this Scratch Mill Scar Fault is vertical. For the same reason, looking at the Abbott Moss Vault over that entire length, that too is, is, is straight, it's got a little bit of a, a wiggle up in, the, up in the northwest there, but I'm going to assume again, without any better information, that this Abbott Moss Vault is also vertical. So that's almost everything except for our dolerite. And again, we don't have any dips on our dolerite, but if we follow this dolerite dike, this thin little red unit that cuts across the entirety of the stratigraphy, cuts across the faults, I'm going to assume that based on the linear nature of that, that outcrop, that the dike also is vertical. Okay, so that's my all of my information that I can glean from the map. Um, I just want to check with comparing my map to the uh, geological column, the stratigraphic column on the left hand side, all of the contacts, let's see, between the millstone grit and the coal measures. Oh, that's interesting. we have between the millstone grit and the coal measures we have a little unconformity there, a gap in geological time and between our yeah, between our millstone grit and our Penrith sandstone there's another unconformity and between the coal measures 
and the Penrith Sandstorm, there's another unconformity. Okay, it's a special kind of unconformity, I guess. It's, this is probably a is it a para conformity where there's a, a gap in geological time, but there isn't an angular difference between the dip of the beds. They're all still dipping in the same way. There's just gaps in between them. But then within the um, Permian rocks and the Triassic rocks, the Penrith sandstone and the St. B sandstone with the Eden shales, they're all conformable. Okay, so at this point, if you had a cross-section panel which looked like this, you've got all of the information that you need to start uh, drawing your cross-section. Okay, so now we're onto our cross-section panel and we can take the data from our cross-section that we made using the map and we can plot it onto our, our cross-section panel. So here's our cross-section strip that we made with all of our data and what we're going to do is use this data to show what the cross-section would look like and what the geology would look like in the subsurface. Now, irritatingly, and this always happens when you turn an image into a PDF, you can see that my A and B on the map is not quite the same size as the A and B um, on the cross-section. I mean, I'll do that better at some point, but, you know, life is, life is definitely far too short. So now what I do is line up A and B as close as I can. I'll just put in a new A and a new B. Um, just to work on this at the moment. And then I'm going to go along onto the top of my cross-sectional panel and mark on the contacts. Yep, and then with the fault, I'll just mark that on lightly as a fault. And then these stratigraphic contacts, which are unconformities, just as a little note to myself, I'm going to remember that. And it's always good to have one of these pencils that has a, that has a rubber on the end, so that you can um, remove these little notes to yourself later on. Okay, I'm not going to bother putting the, the, the colour in, or shall, shall I, I tell you what, I will, I will, I'll just put on a little kind of very, very thin veneer of colour just to make it feel like I'm making progress, which, you know, funny enough, we, we are. So from there to there, we're all in orange, we're all in the Penrith sandstone, big, big, thick bed of it just a very thin veneer on the on the surface and then we're into our Permian rocks that go from there all the way to there with these little beds of dolomite in between them and then what we've got, we've got our um, We've got our Triassic St. B sandstone, which goes like this, and then there's that very skinny um, dike, that dolerite dike that's just there. Okay, now what I have to do is figure out just which one of these features I'm going to plot first. And if we skip back to the map a second, if I just lift this up, so we can see the map, we have to figure out what the youngest feature is. And this map is fantastic, it's got some great cross-cutting relationships. We can see that we've got these, this sequence of sedimentary rocks that goes from oldest to youngest. And we can see that that entire stratigraphy has been cut by this dolerite dike. You know, the, these sediments must have been there before the dike could have come and cut them. 
Now this dike, there isn't a cross-cutting relationship. Oh wait a minute, look there is. If you follow the scratch mill scar fault just to the northwest, if you continue up just off the view of the camera, you can see that that fault has displaced this dolerite dike. So the scratch mill scar fault must be the youngest thing. Then the next youngest thing must be the dolerite dike. And then the next younger set of rocks are our Triassic, then Permian, then Carboniferous. Okay, so that's the order in which we're going to draw them. We're going to draw our faults first, these northwest southeast trending faults, the scratch mill scar fault and the Abbott Moss fault. Then we're going to draw this uh, thinny, skinny little dolerite dike. And then we're going to draw our sedimentary rocks. Okay, So that's the order in which we'll, we'll draw our things and we do it that way so we save ourselves any extra, um, any extra rubbing out. Okay, so Next thing that I need to get out of my, my toolbox is my um, protractor. And then let's start drawing some angles for our, the, the order in which we're going to draw our uh, youngest things first. We've already established that the youngest things based on cross-cutting relationships are the faults. So what I'm going to do is get my compass, my protractor, sorry, crosshair and then drop that onto the top of the cross section panel at the point at which I've got my scratch mill scar fault. Then what I'm going to do using my propelling pencil is draw that angle of dip down to 90 degrees because I'm going to assume this is largely a vertical feature. Okay. Then what I'm going to do to show that fault in the subsurface is just draw those two points where it crops out on the surface at the right angle and hey presto I've got a vertical line it's probably the most long winded way uh, you've ever been shown to draw a vertical line in your life but this is just so you get into the process next fault is the Abbott's Moss fault which I'm also interpreting to be a vertical feature so I get my crosshair of the protractor onto the point at which it hits the cross section on the surface and I mark on at 90 degrees and then I connect those two up and I've got my two faults. Now the next youngest thing that we had was our um, vertical dike which crops out over here and then I'm just going to draw these two contacts of it one there and one there and so I've got my I've got my vertical dike okay then what I can start doing is drawing in our stratigraphic contacts now I've assumed that all of these guys, or I've not assumed, I've, I've, I've interpreted from the relatively consistent um, dips across the area that all of this package of sedimentary rocks are dipping at about 10 degrees towards the east. That's what the dip arrows are telling me. But if you remember to the um, question, we're going to have to draw this uh, cross-section with some vertical exaggeration so what we're going to have to do is modify these, de these dips to, a, a, to take into account that vertical exaggeration factor. Okay, the equation is given to you in the lab but the equation if I were to write it out here is the exaggerated dip is equal to the inverse tangent of the actual dip or the true dip multiplied by 
the exaggeration factor. Okay, so substituting in what we actually have, so that the uh, that should be the tan of the true dip. So it's the inverse tan of tan of ten multiplied by our exaggeration factor, which I think in our lab is. Let me just double check that. Is four. So our vertical exaggeration factor is 4. So using my calculator, tan of 10 multiplied by 4, taking the inverse tan of that answer tells me that the dip of our rocks that we're going to, to be drawing, our exaggerated dip is actually 35 degrees. Okay. So because we've stretched this, um, this uh, cross section so we can actually see the dip of the rocks instead of just being a bunch of parallel lines at 10 degrees, we're going to give them a nice meaty dip of 35 degrees. Okay, you can't just multiply the dip by 4 to get an exaggerated, uh, exaggeration factor. There's actually some level of maths behind it. But that's the, that's the formula that you need. Take the inverse tan of the tan of the true dip multiplied by the exaggeration factor and that will give you the exaggerated dip that you're going to draw. Okay, so these 10 degrees then become 35 degrees. And that's what I'm going to start drawing my um, contacts as. So, let's keep going with the next youngest things, which are our Triassic and Permian sandstones. And what I'm going to do is, for each one of my stratigraphic contacts, I'm going to line up the crosshair of the protractor with the mark on the, the top of the cross section. And then I'm going to count round horizontal 0, 10, 20, 35. And then continue that contact up until the dike. Now when it hits the dike, it's not going to just pass straight through the dike. The, the dike is in the way. But because when dikes are in place, they're not really associated with much slip. They, they, they won't displace contacts. They'll just kind of pop open the crust, intrude, and then go on their merry way. So what I'm able to do is continue that contact on the other side of the dike, okay, which shows how the contact between our Triassic St. B sandstone and the Eden shales, how that will continue past the dike. Okay, then what I'm going to do is continue that process. Got another one at 35 there. I continue that and then step over the dike and then I'll put its bottom contact and when your lines are this close together you don't have to keep marking 35 degrees on it'll probably introduce more error than otherwise you can just trust yourself to draw parallel lines And then that's pretty much this part of uh, the section solved. Now, if we wanted to feel better, we could colour that in. But right now, I'm, j I'm just gonna I'm just gonna crack on. And then I haven't got any stratigraphic contacts within this Penrith sandstone. And so what I'm going to do is using the relative thicknesses of the Eden shales and the Triassic rocks. I think from the um, thickness that you can see on the stratigraphic column I think that the thickness of, of those rocks is similar to the thickness of the Penrith sandstone. So what I'm going to do is um, say from about here
at 35 degrees that would be my interpreted base of the Penrith sandstone okay so I'm just continuing so I'll just draw this contact and then continue it down past the other side of the dike okay at this point I'm going to leave this middle section the fault bounded section of the Penrith sandstone and instead I'm going to um, concentrate on the left hand side of our cross section panel and like I said from the start we've been assuming that these rocks or we've interpreted that these rocks are going to have a constant dip which with our vertical exaggeration is 35 degrees so I've got the base of the Penrith sandstone here and its contact with the coal measures I've lined up the point on the surface of the cross section projected it to 35 degrees and I'll just join them up but I'll stop when I hit that fault surface because at the moment I'm not certain how much slip has occurred along that fault so I don't really know where it's going to continue so I'll do the same thing for the base of the the coal measures get that in at 35 degrees and we're golden now what we're going to have to do is figure out where the boundaries for the coal measures and the millstone grit are beneath this middle section of the Penrith sandstone now what we should do is first of all look at the map and see if it can give us any information about which side of the fault has been moved down relative to the other so if we just go and have ourselves a little look at that scratch mill scar fault on the map if we look along that map that the, the fault trace every now and again you should see a little tick on one side of the fault plane Now, have a look at what that tick means in the key for the geological map. And you should see that that tick denotes which side of the fault has gone down relative to the other, which side has been thrown down relative to the other side. Okay, looking at our scratch mill scar fault, we can see that the tick points to the western side of the fault, and that indicates that the west side of the fault has gone downwards, while the east side has gone relatively upwards. We've had a sort of that kind of movement. So, what we can do is take that information and go back to our, our cross section and we can add in that sense of movement along the fault so the way that we do that is to use a little half arrow to show that the western side of the fault has gone down relative to the eastern side of the fault and that means that if this side if the left hand side as we look at it has gone down and the right hand side has gone up then we can constrain where these contacts between the Penrith sandstone and the millstone grit and the millstone grit and the coal measures uh, sorry the, the Penrith sandstone and the coal measures and the coal measures and the millstone grit we can constrain those to exist somewhere between here and here they can't be any they, this, this side of the fault, the right hand side of the fault can't have been pushed up that much further because if it had then they would con then th those cold measures would would intersect our cross section somewhere in here so we can constrain them to being somewhere within this and because I have no other information to figure out the exact precise displacement of the fault I'm going to say that the Penrith sandstone 
and coal measure contact, the base of the Penrith sandstone is there. Then what I'm going to do is get my protractor, line it up on that point at which I've just marked on the fault plane, and then drop that contact, that dip, to 35 degrees. Now because I've interpreted this, I'm going to denote it with a dashed line. And if this dashed line represents the base of the Penrith sandstone in contact with the top of the coal measures, then I need another one to show the contact between the coal measures and the underlying millstone grid. So that's where I'm going to interpret that it would hit the fault plane. And then I plot a point at 35 degrees to that. And then I dash that in. I can also give the contacts between the coal measures and the um, underlying millstone grit on this side of, of the fault by assuming or by just using that apparent thickness that I've that I've assumed everywhere else. So that's about that's about there. Get that to 35 degrees and then plot it as a dashed line to show my relative uncertainty. Okay. We're almost there. The only thing that's missing for this subterranean geology is the stuff that's beneath the millstone grit. Now if you look at your stratigraphic column, you'll see that beneath the millstone grit, conformably beneath that millstone grit, are some carboniferous limestones. And exactly the same way as we did over here to estimate where the base of the Penrith sandstone would be beneath our Permian rocks. Oh, sorry, where the, yeah, where the base of the um, Penrith sandstone would be. We can also use the stratigraphic column to calculate or otherwise infer where the base of the millstone grit series would be. Now based on the relative thicknesses in the stratigraphic column, I'm going to say that about there would be a good estimate and because those limestone rocks are conformable with the overlying millstone grit I'm going to plot that again at 35 degrees so here we go I've inferred that contact between the carboniferous um, millstone grit series and the carboniferous limestones. Now you can do that more precisely by using a, a calculator to, to look at the um, exact or, or to calculate the um, thickness elsewhere um, but right now I'm going to use that as a pretty good estimate. So now what I can actually start doing is now that I've finished all of my contacts I can start colouring in my geological cross-section and get the finished article out of the way. So I'm going to start with colouring in our, our happy little dolerite dike in red. Then I'm going to move on to our Triassic sandstones. Then I'm going to use a yellow for the Eden shales. And my purple for the inter beds of dolomite. And then 
I've got this faulted area of our Penrith sandstone that on the map is orange and that's where it's going to be on my cross section obviously if you've got the the time and you take pride in your work which you all do I'm sure you take time to to shade this correctly but because you guys probably don't want to watch me covering in uh, for 10 whole minutes I'm just going to try and do these as quickly as possible so these dark greys are the carboniferous coal measures maybe on the video I might try and um, edit this to, to speed up or I guess you guys could just skip over until I'm doing something a bit different. So that's our coal measure and then very lightly let me just show the the millstone grip. Now one thing that my cross section requires in order for it to be correct. We'll get to that in a minute. Let me just put in my general blues for my limestones. Now one thing that the my assumptions in my cross section require to be correct is that this second fault, this Abbott Moss fault, it has a similar downthrown side. So you remember the scratch mill scar fault, this one. We've interpreted from the map that or the map is telling us that the left hand side of the fault has gone down relative to the right hand side. In order for our cross section or my interpretation of our cross section to work, this Abbott's Moss fault must also have that same displacement. The left hand side of the fault must have gone down relative to the right hand side. So I'm seriously, absolutely hoping that when I look back at the map, to double check my interpretation is correct. I'm sincerely hoping that the dip tick, or the downthrown tick rather, of the fault plane is pointing towards the west. So let's have a little look. So here's our Abbott Moss fault, which you can follow like this. And thank the maker, you can see here we've got a tick that's pointing towards the west side of the fault. There's one there, there's another one there, thank goodness, and another one there. So, whew, our cross-section interpretation holds true with our map interpretation. So we can just put those arrows, those half arrows, to show the sense of movement along that fault. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good section so far, and then maybe just for practice, what we could do is, I don't need those unconformity there, I know what I'm doing now. Maybe what I could do is just project sensibly, you know, you don't want to go to the moon or anything, the continuation of the geology above the surface. Just to show what the geology would be doing prior to modern erosional processes. So I'm just going to use the base and the top of the uh, Permian rocks because otherwise I'd be there for all day and then just finish off our dike chap and then that shows us what the geology would have would have done um, prior to modern erosional surf, uh, modern erosional processes to give us the current weathering surface.
Okay, now we're on to uh, the point at which we need to do our, our housekeeping measures to give it a scale and to, to give it a key and so on. And because we've used this vertical exaggeration, we have two different scales. We've got the horizontal scale and then we've got the vertical scale. And the two aren't the same because we've stretched, we've pulled our cross section in the, in the vertical axis um, to give us that exaggeration factor. Let's start with the horizontal scale though because that's dead easy. If you think about what we've done for our um, cross section, all we did was take the information from the map, put it on a piece of paper and then transfer that onto a cross section. So we haven't changed the scale of the map, we've just transferred data from one to the other. So we can use exactly the same scale for our horizontal scale on the cross section as is provided to us by the map. So if you look at the base of your map, you should see a scale, which is 1 to 50,000. And because we haven't done anything to our horizontal dimension, we've just taken information from the map and put it on the cross section, we can use the same scale. Now, because we've exaggerated our vertical scale, we've stretched it by four times. For every unit, we're seeing four times less than compared to the horizontal scale, if that makes sense. We've, we've stretched our, our we've used, we started with our horizontal scale and then we stretched it by a factor of four. So our vertical scale is simply 50,000 divided by four, which comes to one, two, one, two, five, zero, zero. Okay. That's pretty good. Uh, then the only other stuff that we need are to put our rock types on, and I think we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So on the left hand side here, I'm just going to give me a key of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll just turn those into, into squares. You guys can obviously do this with a ruler. And you can hold your ruler straight, I hope. And then we simply add in... Um, uh, usually in, in stratigraphic order that makes the most sense are, are, are rocks so what I've got is at the base I've got my carboniferous limestone then I've got my millstone grit then I've got my coal measures which then give way to the Penrith sandstone. Then I've got my Eden shales with intervening or interbedded dolomites. And then on top of those, I've got my Triassic St. B's sandstones. And then separate from that, I've got my dollar right, so we could give that um, we could give those those names. And then coal measures. And then let's go for the millstone. And then we've got carb limestones. Okay, at that point, you know, you're pretty much done. Maybe you could um, say which fault they are. So this is our Abbott Moss. 
fault and this is our scratch mill scar fault and then at this point presentation issues aside you've got a defensible cross section for the area so have a go at this yourself and we'll get together um, when things are back to normal and we can um, see how well we've done in understanding generation of cross section thanks for listening guys I'll see you in the next video